Good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to a very special session today at the Zero Project Conference. My name is Stefan Dertnik. I'm honored to be your chairman here today, the moderator of this session, and uh, let me tell you why I'm so passionate about it. I had a 25 years career in consulting worldwide and could help a lot of large companies improving their businesses, becoming more profitable, becoming more successful. But five years ago, I decided that all my competencies could be much better used with startups, especially with social startups, because they face the same problems, but they don't have as much money. So I went into becoming a business angel. Uh, I was a business angel investor in social enterprises, and I lately also started my own company, which is called Future Space, which is about digital integration and inclusion. And today, we have a very special session. How should I say this best? Who here is from the US? Please raise your hand. So we have a few people. Maybe you're familiar with shark tanks. Shark tank. Uh, who is from the UK? Anybody from the UK here? Anybody from the UK here? No? Well, they have something similar called Dragon's Den. And the Germans, they don't like these wild animals, so they call it the Höhle der Löwen, so it's the lion's den. And we Austrians, we're very famous for being straightforward. For us, this is two minutes, two million. So let me welcome to this session, where you will have here presentations of four social startups, and I'm not sure that startup is the right name, because most of them have already a product, a product out in the market, and we are, they are here to present this to you and to get feedback. To get feedback, to develop further, and to become better. And that's our role here today, with all these experts in the room. So this is like a, a shark's tank with experts, not a shark's tank with consumers. And I think that is the great benefit here. And on top of it, we have here a great panel, which I will ask to introduce themselves immediately. And thank you very much for coming here. And the procedure will be that we have the presentations. Afterwards, the panel is asked to ask them questions, giving feedback. Is this a viable business model? Where do you see more opportunities? Where can growth come from? Where can the impact probably be even increased? And since we have a little bit more time than originally planned, um, we, I will also ask you in the auditorium here to ask one or two questions if you want. So please, while you're listening, think through, is there anything where you really can contribute with all your knowledge, all your expertise to make these startups more successful? So let me first uh, ask the podium to introduce yourself here. Helena Rosandic, please uh, tell us where you're from, what you're doing, and how you will support this group here today. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope we will not be sharks today. I will be a little <laughs> bit uh, less aggressive. <laughs> My name is Helena Rosandic. I'm originally coming from Croatia. However, now I live in between Austria and Russia. And similar to Stefan, I've been in corporates for around 15 years, but in the last five years I've been, I dedicated my time to, to startups. One of my jobs is uh, co-founder of One Million Startups, and One Million Startups is an organization, a uh, global organization that started here from Vienna, which helps promote startups around the world, especially the ones who are supporting SDGs and social businesses. So I'm really looking forward to the presentations today. Thank you. So a warm welcome to Helen, please. So, Mohamed, please. Hello, everybody. My name is Mohamed Ba, and I'm originally from Mali, in case you don't know where Mali is, but I grew up in the U.S. Uh, I spent 18 years uh, living, well, actually working for the big companies in the U.S., and uh, for the past four years, I've been doing something called policy, in case you know what policy means, but it's about the environment. And my job is quite interesting in the sense that uh, it's really to help countries build their innovation ecosystem, their digital innovation ecosystem. So all these crazy people we pushed into the death, into the valley of death. How can we make sure that all these startups survive more? And uh, in that process, I've learned a lot, and I am looking forward to our presentations, and hopefully these startups have more success than what I've seen out there. Welcome to Mohamed. Rose van Cleef, please. 
Good morning, my name is Roos van Kleef. I'm originally from the Netherlands, but I work for the Kahane Foundation. That's a Swiss family foundation. We, uh, we are only a grant-making organization, um, and we support NGOs, MPOs, um, mostly in the field of migration integration, um, inclusive education, and accessibility. My professional background has always been in the funding industry. Uh, I used to work for one of the largest family uh, foundations in the Netherlands, which had a venture philanthropy approach. And um, after that, I worked for a Swiss corporate foundation. And um, I'm very excited to hear uh, new stories because we're always uh, interested in pilots and in innovative ideas. So thank you for having me. And we're excited to have some funders here. Oh, yes. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm Christopher Lee. I'm from the States. Um, I work for G3 ICT and IAAP, which promote the CRPD back to 2006. Um, um, however, my role today, I think, on this panel is around um, uh, social entrepreneur. I started a, a program in 2006 with about $600,000 of U.S. money, and this program was housed in an academic environment. And I grew that to several million dollars before I left about a year ago. Um, and we focused on accommodating people with disabilities. So our business model was somewhat unique and, and, and successful. So hopefully I can bring some, some knowledge in that area. Thank you very much. And now the projects are coming. And the first one will be presented by Christian Voglauer from Austria. It's from Optivit, the Hilfsgemeinschaft Austria. Christian, please. Hello, good morning to you. Um, so I was told I have five minutes, so it's probably five minutes, five millions then, right? Uh, okay, so then you turn into sharks, right? right, right, right. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, yeah, uh, very well, welcome uh, from my side. I'm uh, today going to present you uh, Optivit which is uh, one of our uh, currently research projects, which is funded under the benefit program from FFG, the Austrian um, Research Funding Agency. Um, so, as I said, we are uh, currently a research project, but we are planning to uh, progress after that stage and um, going to uh, develop a product out of what we found here already. Now, uh, what is the background of our uh, current development? The thing is, Ever more people are watching videos. And ever more people are watching videos online. In fact, 70% of data traffic in the mobile networks is related to watching mobile videos. So 70% of all data sent worldwide is to access video material, streamed video material. So, what many content providers are doing is optimizing their sites, their mobile sites, their desktop sites, to be accessible. But what they're not doing is optimizing their content. So, a visually impaired person can access YouTube, can access Vimeo, can access all those sites, Netflix, whatever you have, they can access that. But the content that is shown to them is not optimized for them. And we're here to change that. We're here to improve the visual experience for our members, for the members of the Association of the Blind and Visually Impaired, and for all people all around the globe. Now, i got you some figures here from the US market to show you why we think it is a market out there. We're generally talking about 8 to 10% of the persons who might require visual improvement of streamed content. However, everyone can use that. Every person here in the room, every person in Austria, in the world, can use those filters we are creating to improve the visual experience for them. And that's also due to the fact that many people use monitors, laptops, that are not actually qu uh, qualitatively calibrated. So you can also work on that and enlarge the audience we have for our tools. Um, nevertheless, 
and that's one thing um, that was uh, also really important for us. Uh, when you look at YouTube user numbers, 50% of uh, the 75 plus year old internet users also use YouTube to watch streaming video. So we're not only talking here about the like 25 to 30 year old going on the street, having their uh, mobile phone in front of them and watching YouTube. We're also talking about the elderly who are watching at home or who are watching abroad while commuting probably or while going to uh, see relatives. And these people we also target. So what do we actually provide with Optivit? We provide persons with visual impairment an easily usable and freely customizable option to create filters and to save those filters. What is a filter? A filter is basically an overlay to the streamed video content. So what you get is an individualized solution for your level of eyesight. That's totally individualized to you and that can also be individualized due to the content you want to access. So for example, if you're watching a news show, you probably want other improvements than when you're watching a fast-paced action movie or when you're watching sports. Because probably for sports, you need some improvement in finding like the, law, the, sm the small balls that are uh, going over the field when you're watching soccer. Or uh, if you're watching golf, you probably want to see the ball. Well, at least I want to see the ball because I can't see the ball at golf sports, right? And watching hockey, whatever you have it, right? So, um, we're using that and we're currently developing the solution to have you use those filters online and offline. Currently, it's only an online version, but we're uh, in the process of developing an offline version as well. So you can download the videos and improve that. We're not the only ones doing that. I totally have that. Um, for the online versions, as far as I know, we are the only ones to do that. Uh, and what we want to do is actually, and, and that's probably something that uh, you can help us with, um, we want to reach the content providers of this world, right? Because we know that they are the source of our material. They are the ones, if they say, yes, we want to integrate you, yes, we want to cooperate with you, they can integrate that in their systems and they can then improve the performance and the visibility for all the customers, basically, right? So, and what I want to do at the end of this presentation, and because talk is cheap, but showing is better, so I'll just head over there and give you a quick impression of what we're doing. So, to get the, the recording, I have to change the mics, but I think that works perfectly, yeah. All right, so now, um, this is our demo website you see there. Um, I hope the sharks can see it as well. And uh, we preloaded here a video of the German uh, news show, the SIB1. And if you start those two, and there you can see you can really easily change the appearance. You can also invert colors, whatever you like, right? But that's just one thing. You can also go there and improve saturation, for example, right? You can improve brightness. And that's really easily doable here. And in this way, persons with visual impairment can improve the video in the way they like it. So just pause that there. Okay, thank you. Um, and we have many more filters that we're trying out. And um, we already ran those tests with uh, more than 30 persons with visual impairments. And they all had their individual filters set for them. And they all experienced a great, great improvement in accessing the content. And they really felt uh, empowered by being able to watch videos as they required them. So 
the idea here is to have that platform more accessible for visually impaired users, right? To broadcast it, to bring it about, and then uh, to improve the experience of watching videos, watching streaming content to everyone here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian from OptiVit. And now, please, if you come over here so the panel can see you, and please, the panel, ask your questions. Um, thank you for that. I uh, was wondering, you talk about the service providers. Uh, those are the big ones. Maybe they don't really answer immediately if you call. Um, have you talked to the local service providers and the content providers? And if so, what were their reactions and will they want to adapt it? Uh, we actually talked to the Austrian Broadcasting Association and um, they're on board. So they said um, they would like to use that for their mediatheque which is like the, the content providing of the Austrian Broadcasting Association. And yeah, so they're on board. And we're currently talking uh, with other national uh, broadcasting stations, uh, whether they also want to partner with us um, in setting up the, the initial uh, pilot and trials. <clears throat> I'm struggling with your business model. <laughs> And uh, I think the market you're looking at is not the right market. I think that you're trying to, I mean, your promise is to say that it's a content at the source, but in reality, you know, how are you going to target all these broadcasters, all these content providers? It seems the technology you provide, like making the screen vivid, the filters, all of that, your better chance to actually put this in the device themselves, like the Samsung device and different devices, and then your business model will have to be some kind of app which will let people tap into the customized filter that now they can take and the, the experience with them, right? So from that point of view, I think you, you're looking at the wrong market segment or the wrong type of source. Your promise okay. is great, yep. but it's technology, <laughs> as you know, technology can change, yeah. and how are you going to protect yourself? And how are you going to create an experience? How are you going to keep your customers once you lock them in? How are you going to make money? And for me, this has to be an app model and working with the device manufacturers and then keep improving the technologies and then filters mm -hmm. because I assume it's just crunching numbers, right? <laughs> Every device has a processor, so you just have to provide an yeah. API through your thing. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you for the input. Um, that's a, a really valuable uh, way to look at it. Um, we're currently, because we have the connection to the, to the content providers, that was uh, our first uh, approach. But I see where you're going, and uh, that's definitely something that we can, can think about in the future. Thank you. Great. I was wondering, what, what did you have in mind in terms of business model? How did you think, I mean, what, because I'm sure you made some, some research on that <laughs> end as well. What, were your, what was your idea on, on yeah. how to make money? Now, basically the business model was to um, have the, um, the technology set up and uh, developed and then uh, license it to the, the content providers, right? So that the idea is to have a, a small licensing fee per view Right? So every time you use that, uh, you get a, get a licensing fee because that you can, uh, the, the content providers can reimburse that by uh, the added value they have through selling ads to the additional viewers. Right? So that's the, like the, the trade-off. Um, you, you, you provide the, the improvement of the visual uh, content, therefore more people are going to visit your portal, more people are going to access your content, and the more uh, access you have to your content, the more uh, ads you can uh, promote and the more ads you can uh, sell, basically, and then you have this uh, more or less win-win situation for, for us and for the content providers. So that was the idea, basically. Christopher? Yeah, Christian, you look like, uh, it seems like you have a good product. I mean, it looks, it looks good. Um, 30 users um, that you've tested it with, um, why so few? Uh, it's not easy to find users uh, who want to, to try out uh, new technology, especially in the field of uh, visually impaired persons. 
um, it's quite hard to find users, right? And um, for that, that was basically the first test, right? So we needed to find out uh, what we need to improve um, to get it to a larger audience. So for uh, end of this year and next year, we scheduled large uh, sample user tests where we want to really roll it out to, to a large population and, and see what their feedback is. But for, that was like for the first tests. So this is part of the research pilot in yeah. a sense. So I didn't see really a lot of research numbers up there. Um, where, where are you at with that? Uh, we, we actually uh, crunched the numbers on the, on the research we did there, right? Um, I just didn't want to put it up because I, I personally always find those uh, charts quite boring. But uh, you love them, okay, sorry for that. <laughs> no, uh, what we experienced was that, um, as I said, um, we also uh, used some user experience uh, valuations and all the, the users we ran the test with all had higher user experience uh, valuations after using our filters than before. We also did some like uh, incognito tests where we applied uh, different filters than the filters they set um, and judged, uh, judged whether there was a difference there. And uh, once we, we applied their filters and we applied different filters, we also could see that there was a difference in user experience. So um, we really see that the, the filters do have an impact and we see that uh, personalized filters do have an uh, even larger impact on um, on the perceiving of uh, visual content uh, than without. Yeah, I'm just wondering uh, if you've explored any of the incubation programs out there. No, not yet. Not yet. It may be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Thank you. Okay. Is there probably one last question from the audience, from the large audience here? Sure. Any question you want to ask? None? Okay. Then thank you very much, Christian, from OptiVit. Uh, we see here a project on the way of development. There is already a kind of an MVP tested with 30 people. But thank you very much for the panel here. I think very valuable questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Alexander Nikitovich. And thank you very much, Alexander, for jumping in for your colleague who, who got sick, I understand. And he will present the social skills animation. Please, Alexander. Hi to everybody. Uh, my name is Alexander Nikitovic. Let me introduce myself. I'm an actual occupational therapist. I work with the people with autism the last 18 years. And uh, this idea about the social skills emanation came from a therapeutic center from Athens. Uh, with collaboration with Serbian company, which made a software. Uh, I'm also president of a social uh, corporation company which uh, have a coffee shop actually in Athens uh, with a few people, 18 people working there with uh, different disabilities. Uh, I'm also the Special Olympics coach, head coach of Greek team. So. That's me. Uh, and now I'm going to show you what we made. Uh, we made the software which, which allows the user, therapist, parents, to transform uh, one social story to animation video and to present it to a user for a special therapeutic goals. Uh, it's very easy to use. You need just two minutes to make animation with different, uh, with dialogue, auto recording, interaction between the people, characters, interaction between the characters and the uh, different kind of objects in the application. And also one of the most important things, it's emotions, which a lot of uh, people in autism spectrum have difficulty to understand. So, SSA is addressed to uh, therapists, psychiatrists, occupational therapists, scene teachers, scene therapists, uh, logopeds, speech therapists, and sure, parents. 
our target group, it's, this is our target group. They're, and uh, our goal is to make their life easier, make their, uh, their job easier and more fun. So that's, uh, that's our uh, target group. Suggestion. This, uh, this application is made on, uh, on already uh, worldwide uh, known therapeutic methods. It's social, social story method, comic strip method, and video modeling. We just combine these methods together and uh, we made the software which uh, it's much easier to use and with better and easier goals using already known worldwide methods. Notice, it's not a method, it's just a tool. You're just helping people, helping parents, helping therapists uh, by using this tool, make their life easier and make the people with uh, autism and other dif uh, disabilities uh, to make understand the life with ease. Because we may talk to them and uh, we can see that they cannot under understand us verbally. But if you show him them a picture, show, show them uh, animation, they can understand much easier. And on this way we can make their life easier and they can learn a lot of things. Right now, we have made the house. The first module, it's house. So uh, the house is divided in five rooms. Uh, bedroom, balcony, living room, the kitchen, uh, and bathroom. So uh, our goal is not to stay just on the house. Next project is only being in producing right now. It's a school. The third one is going to be sexual education, which is very important. Urban environment and also transportation. So uh, our goal is to make all society, make all society in, uh, put it in the application, in the software, to make all the kind of animations to make the people with difficulties understand the world with ease. I'm going to show you right now the small video and to understand how it easy it's to make an animation. You just need two minutes. You click the person, you click the button, he's doing the thing. That easy. Very easy and I'm telling you, you just needed two minutes to make a movie and everybody knows how when we talk about animations, uh, how people think it's very hard. We need a lot of time to fix it. We need uh, professionals to make the movies. We made the application which anybody can make animation. From uh, my experience, I have two two daughters, they're six years old, one and four other. They're playing with this. They can make animation alone. <clears throat> Press here. So, I'm gonna just go through the process of uh, social skills animation. I'm a therapist, I'm not a businessman. I, it was just idea on the beginning for uh, our center in Athens. So as the years were passing, we kept this for years. This project was working for years. Uh, as the years were passing, the project was better and better. Uh, we have like 18 therapists behind the project, which are giving their advices to a development team on this way, we are uh, closely 
working together with the development team and making changes all the time. So uh, I think we have covered all the needs, what is needed to give to uh, users to use the social skills animation. The most important thing, there is no borders. It can be used in any place in the world. Because the dialogue and the uh, language, it's audio recorded. So the character, it's speaking a, a language you're, which you're gonna be recording. On this way, you're making a dialogue and there is no border. It can be used in any place in the world. Target groups of uh, diag diagnosis, it's behavioral difficulties, ACD, ADHD, intellectual disabilities, and syn the, the syndromes, different syndromes, syndrome down, and so on. Uh, aim to improve. What we are trying to improve with this application and user, what he's going to do with this application. He's going to improve the uh, independent living skills first. Social skills. How we're going to talk, how, what we're going to do in our environment. And uh, the people with different difficulties, and especially people with autism, they have a hard time understanding verbal uh, verbal uh, words. If you combine it with visual, visual and verbal together, it's much easier for them to understand. Also, communication skills, dialogue, behavioral. Behavioral is directly combined with social skills. If we understand what you're telling me, my behavior is going to be better. If I don't understand what you're telling me, my behavior is going to be not quite good and dialogue skills. Uh, this application have been, it's new, last six months we have, you, you can find it on the social skills animation site. You can download it from the social skills animation site. There is five, five hours trial version, active five hours. And uh, also you can buy it from the, from the site, download it from the site, or we can provide you with a USB, which is much easier to use because you can use it in more computers. Uh, I have to say one more thing. Right now it's working on the Windows. It's not working on the iPads, and it's working on the Mac. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. Really a great tool. I, told, I tell you, I went to the website and I downloaded it, and even with my 57 years of age, within a very short period of time, I could really program a little thing like as you have shown. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So please, the panel, the question. Yeah, yeah so my question, um, uh, thank you for the presentation, but my question is, You're welcome. so is it free? It is... Uh, it's not free. Uh, it is free? It's not. It's, oh, not, it's, not, free. Not, it's not free. Okay, it's I not missed free. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't... I didn't say about it. It's 250 euros okay. for and a license. License, it's, uh, you can have it forever. And it's how many installations do you have right now? Uh, how many the, people have downloaded it? Uh, we have around, uh, it's actually new, new, new uh, application. Six months it's loaded on the site. It's around, it's not a lot, around a lot. 30, 30, 40. 30 or 40, okay. Yeah, yeah. Are there any competitors out there? No. So right now, I don't think so. There's someone like that. I, I love it, and the reason why I love it because I have a daughter who has autism and I understand exactly what yeah. you're saying. You're speaking the same language. And yeah. it's very difficult, and I've not seen an application that has animation because animation is everything. And you answered my other question, which is where do we buy it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, you know, as I say, as a parent who has a kids with autism, if they sell you a crystal ball and they say this will cure the autism, you will buy it, right? But, but more to the serious part of this uh, business, which is 
the business model you're looking at. Okay, so you need it in different apps, you need it in different sort of devices. Uh, but making an animation, even though you say it's easy, it could also be that maybe you have a catalog or users are co-creating these animations and then different people have access to the different animations that other people have made, right? So that's something you might want to build into the model. So if I, as a parent, create an animation for a specific purpose and for a specific environment, it's not a bathroom, it's not, and I can, offline I'll tell you more about the bathroom story, but. I would love that, <laughs> I would love that. yeah. But, but the point is you need to be able to tap into the creativity of the platform users. Until you design it as a platform, then you're not gonna have a competing uh, solutions. But it's a great application, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. That's what I wanted to ask. I saw, sorry. How how tailor made can it be? How customized can it be? You know, because I, I guess there are many. It's it's uh, custom made. Everybody makes his environment, mm -hmm. make his dialogues, make uh, uh, his uh, emotions, whatever he wants. Everything is uh, interactive in the application. Mm -hmm. Uh, even even the the glass, even the 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 table, everything is interactive there. So you just uh, you don't have to have any language, don't know any language. You don't have to write anything. Everything is made by clips, clip clip clip, and you finished here. Yeah. Um, you are saying that it's 250 euros, and then it's a license. You can have it forever. Does that also sorry? Yeah, yeah sorry. Is does that also entitle uh, updates? Because maybe the world will look very differently in 10 years. How how will that work? So the the updates it's gonna come like small updates. It's gonna be free. But some other up, updates like let's say uh, we are now making the uh, new module, which you're gonna go passing through one room to other room, which is much bigger uh, update. It's gonna maybe have some costs more. Extra. Yeah, I, I was just curious, um, have you explored those issues with accessibility, obviously, with virtual reality, but have you explored virtual reality? Um, uh, 3D, you are thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, there are two things we were thought about that. Mm -hmm. uh, people with autism, they can understand much easier 2D than 3D. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. So that's, that's the most important thing, why we didn't go on the 3D. Okay. And 3D, it's more difficult to make, yeah. that's sure. But most, mostly it was the, the, because it's more un understood uh, from the people if it's 2D. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think there is also the opportunity to really rethink the pricing model, to have people test it as, it, because what you want is a lot of users creating a lot of animations. And then the scale effects will lower the cost for you, but to get people to pay 200, which is the typical PEC modules, you know, they all cost 250, 300, but really they don't work, right? You want to scale and really win in this model, you need to lower the price, make it per month or something, and then let people test it. As they co-create these different environments for you, that's actually your incremental value, so you really want, might wanna rethink that part. As I said before, I'm not a businessman, I'm a therapist. <laughs> but this is very, uh, thank you very much for advice. That's what we need. That's what we are looking for, for our for support. Uh, and we need help to continue to more make all the society to put it in the application and uh, they can be used for all the situations. Right now it's just situations in the house. Okay, in your, Imagination, you can make it and you can make a house, a school, or you can make a dialogue or a playground, you can make it from the, from the balcony. Uh, but our goal is all society to be in, on, the, on, the, on this software. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raj Alexander. We all look forward to bring your 30 downloads to 3 million downloads, and I hope we can help you with that. Thank you very much. So, our next presenter is Gavin Neat from the UK. Gavin, please.
Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am not nervous, uh, but I am incredibly excited. Um, it's okay. Let's speak up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm not nervous, but I'm incredibly excited because um, I love Zero Project, uh, Zero Conference. It's amazing. Um, but also, I know that I am now presenting to the world in what I am presenting to you now, and I very much hope you will be as excited about it as much as I am. Um, I am the CEO of a technology company, but this was not always the case. I was, for 18 years, a guide dog mobility instructor. I used to train people how to use guide dogs. Uh, it was the best job, maybe even still the best job in the world, um, because of the satisfaction you get when you see one of maybe up to six people per year walking up the street with their new guide dog. I loved it, not just because I could spend all of my time training guide dogs, but also because I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt and uh, imitation Oakleys. Uh, so it was very relaxing. Uh, but as in this picture, I am standing between one of my guide dog owners, Murray, and his dog, Scott, um, between uh, him and a pedestrian crossing. And one of the things I noticed very early on in my career was that it was very difficult for somebody who was not just blind, but in many other situations uh, disabled and unable to press the button at the pedestrian crossing. Uh, as a guide dog mobility instructor, you are not expected to come up with inventions and solutions, but in 2009, I invented a way of the mobile phone pressing the button at the pedestrian crossing. Uh, this is now being rolled out in Scotland and the United Kingdom, and hopefully one day the world. Um, but is, we now have an entire town in Scotland where every crossing is operated by the smartphone and indeed uh, mobile uh, Apple watches. Uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. Uh, I actually wanted to talk to you about something that maybe is even more important and much bigger. Uh, on the screen, there is a picture of a man uh, interacting with his mobile phone. He has a long cane in his hand, and it says, I have walked into shops and I have stood there, and I have waited, holding my cane, and nobody has come to talk and talk to me, so I have just walked straight back out. 75% of people who live with disability experience this on a regular basis. They are not engaged with by customer service teams. And as a result, in the UK alone, 249 billion pounds per year is potentially lost by businesses who do not engage with disabled shoppers or travelers. And there is a good reason for this. There is a very good reason why customer service teams don't know what to do when Ken walks into the shop. Lots of reasons, but this is a cycle uh, that goes round and round and round. Number one on this picture on the screen is the incident of anyone who is disabled walking into a shop and receiving poor service. They then complain. Increasingly, people who are disabled are complaining on social media, but with no real way of finding a solution other than an apology from the company, who then say, we are terribly sorry, we will do more staff training. They train their staff. Staff come and go. They leave. It might be tourism. They might just be there for a summer. So time passes, and then strangely enough, there's another incident, which leads to a complaint, which leads to an apology, which leads to more staff training. And it goes round and round and round. Staff training is so important, face-to-face -face staff training. More and more we are having people who are disabled who are advocates in this area, and that is really important, but it is not the only solution, nor can it be in the future. What we do with Needbox is we have an application as the person walks towards the building, it sets off a geofence at the building that is running our system. The people inside the building get customer information. They get an overview, they get top tips, they get a photograph of the person, they get the name of the person and they have a message from that person as to what they want to achieve on that day. This empowers the person who is going into the shop. It helps the customer service team because they now know what to do. It helps the business because the business now has more people coming through the door. It helps society because the customer service person then helps other people they meet in their life. The system was launched last year in the United Kingdom in Scotland and already we have 
sold it into all of these organizations. Uh, Edinburgh Airport, Royal Bank of Scotland, the Scottish Government, House of Fraser, Jenner's, which is a retail store, uh, Visit Scotland, Dundee Council, Stirling Council, the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, Atos, St Andrew's Links Golf Course, Edinburgh Printmakers, Guide Dogs to the Blind, RNIB, Nat West. Uh, currently, we are in talks with international airports uh, and Microsoft and Google and lots of organizations. In fact, just before Christmas, we were nominated for a Disability Smart Award for newest and most innovative technology. In the finals of this award were Microsoft, Facebook, and Neatbox. My company has two people in it. <laughs> this is not an easy thing to win. In fact, it was won by Microsoft for Office 365. Uh, so, yeah, what can you do? Um, this is a, we have installed across lots of venues, but it is how people are responding that is massive for me. Anne Donnelly said, these visits with Welcome App have helped me get out. There is purpose in going out if you know you can get help and not struggle to find somewhere to sit or find a member of staff. And I think that it is really important. It would be too easy to become housebound, ordering online and missing out on interaction with other people. The application, the mobile phone, stays in the person's pocket when they walk into the building. This encourages human-to-human -human interaction. So what's next for my company? In the UK, we are covering, well, we are covering Ireland, Republic of Ireland, and the United Kingdom. We're rolling the platform out across the United Kingdom. There are 200,000 businesses that we know that we can install in at this time. We have business models. We know exactly what we're charging because it's a free app to the user. They don't pay a penny for it. The business pays this in a monthly subscription SaaS model. Who knew that after 28 years training dogs that I could be a businessman? In 2020, we are looking to expand this across the world, uh, hence my, why I am very excited to talk to you guys today. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Gavin. It looks like we all have to hurry up to bring the neat box to us before the Brexit <laughs> avoids that coming. Um, so, please, uh, are there questions? Can you, can you tell me more about the architecture? You just showed the app, but when you talk about geofencing, is it GPS-based geofencing? What's behind in terms of yeah. services and, and uh, information sharing between the store and how much all this costs in a sense, right? What's the business model? There seems lots of questions here. Okay, right. Um, so the person downloads an app, the business uh, gets a web server, so they just have to log in. You can log in on any device at all, as long as you have internet connection. The person says, and I'm, I can demonstrate to people later, in fact, I'm doing a talk after this one, if people want to see a demonstration. But uh, the person uses the app to say where they are going and what their needs are on that day. Everything else about the condition that they have and they want people to know about is in the background. They don't have to specify anything else. It's very simple. The business then just enters into the web server. This gives them all of the information they need as to how to interact with the person. The business pays uh, a subscription model, a SaaS model, which they pay on an annual basis, and it just rolls around, and it's not expensive. I have two questions. Um, one is, uh, what happens when, for example, uh, it's really, really busy, and uh, the business just can't uh, handle someone with extra, extra needs? Um, do they send something back? Is there communication around that? Um, or is there a solution to that? And the second one being, this is very much about human interaction, I can imagine, which is usually important. Um, but there's also the physical infrastructure, I can imagine, for many people. So do they also get, if they say to, I, I go to the Royal Bank of Scotland on this do you get a notification saying, oh, maybe you should be you know, aware of that it's really difficultly accessible or what? Is that built in? So those would be yeah, that's questions the well. second question uh, first. Yes, it's all built into the system, um, system and you would see that if you were able to see the system. Uh, but I can show you later, and please trust me on this. Um, in the first question, uh, what we are looking at here is managing expectation. Uh, when I walk into a shop, uh, and I have a uh, disability, uh, the first thing I am possibly thinking about is, oh my God, I've just walked for 100 meters, now I have to get into a queue. The beautiful 
part of this is now I am already in a queue just by walking into the shop. I can take a seat at this time knowing that I can spend time before somebody will come to meet me because they know I have arrived. Back slightly to the first question, we don't just use beacons, we also, sorry, we don't just use GPS, we also use iBeacons, which lets somebody know when they have actually walked in the door. So the first thing you do when you walk into a shop is normally get into a queue or start shopping. Our person can actually take a seat knowing that a customer service person will get to them. For many people, that can be really useful because it gives them a chance to rest, but also it means that they uh, know that somebody is aware of their need. In this version, we don't have a two-way communication system, but we are working with uh, London Northeast Rail um, with a passenger assist on the railways, and we are adding in a two-way communication saying, so we can manage expectation, so um, it'll be five minutes before I get to you. Yes, that's fine, no problem at all. Or I'm in a rush, I've got to go, please can you see me earlier, this kind of thing. Um, we're also working with bus companies because we recognize that if you are standing at a bus stop and you know you need to get the next bus, uh, if the bus, say you are a wheelchair user, the bus driver can send you a message back saying that there is already somebody with a wheelchair, or indeed can turn around to the person with a pram and say, please fold up your pram, I am going to be picking up somebody in a wheelchair in a second. So it works in so many different environments. I, I really like this product a Thank lot. Um, training, you talk about the very beginning of your presentation. Um, you're notifying the people within the, the, the organization that, that they're coming into, but what about training? How, how does that, do you have videos that are tied into the, the app? Um, so yeah, the, the beautiful part of, one of the beautiful parts about this, and I believe there are many, uh, is that the overview and the top tips that we provide the company with have been provided to us by organizations that represent the disability the person is wanting them to know about. So we then provide a link as a resource to the organization that has provided the information. That can be anything that the, the, the charity or organization wants to promote to the business. So we cover three URL links. One is their main page. Two might be a video, if they are producing a video, and we have a great one for Ataxia, or we don't, but they do. Um, and then the third might be, and this is how you can support our organization. If it's a charity, then that's great. It might be that the business is looking for a charity to sponsor the next year, and they realize that this tiny organization, Ataxia is a great example, with only 10,000 people in the UK with Ataxia, they might never have got funding. So they then know, hey, we, we've got a customer that always comes in here, and they like us to know they have Ataxia, and we can actually support them. I think one, one last question. Uh, this is about scale. I, I like the application as well. I, and then to give you an example, so you go to Disney, right? There is a special line for people with disability. But it's everywhere, right? But you say there's two of you, right? So you have to think about a model where you build an ecosystem of stakeholders who will actually deploy your application in these premises worldwide. So it cannot just be you going one-on-one. -on -one. That's, that's passe now. You, you're way past that, right? Yeah, I've been quite busy. built a whole different model, business model, that will basically work on an ecosystem of around you. And then you deploy this ecosystem a lot, then you really have a business model, right? So now all I need is one app. Okay, I'm in this town. Where do I have access to a restaurant? Where do I have access to shopping? Where do I have access to, and the sky's the limit. Indeed, and this is something that we are very aware of. I have uh, good support from Scottish Government, uh, and also we, are, uh, we have uh, business advisors who are involved in this. Our business model covers this. In fact, we have just gone through fundraising. Uh, we are in the process of raising half a million pounds, and by the end of this year, we will have 14 members of staff, and then start looking at how we internationalize this system. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. As Mohamed has said, the sky is the limit, and the zero project is the jump board. Um, so, the next presenter, Ricardo, from NEED, uh, uh, Ricardo, he will, uh, from OS, Accessibility, Accessibility OS, sorry, Accessibility OS, um, as we Austrians used to say, uh, no mountains but sheep. Ricardo, please. Good morning. Good morning, all. Thank you to the Zero Project. Thank you to the ESSO Foundation uh, for 
allow me to present uh, uh, what I'm going to show you today. Um, it's great to be here and see much, so many uh, meeting with so many friends. Uh, my name is Ricardo Garcia. I'm the account manager at Accessibility Oz, a company out of Australia, also uh, based in the U.S. Uh, I've been uh, working in the field of uh, disability inclusion since 2004. Uh, first of all, involved with the ONTHE Foundation, Spanish Blind People Organization, projects in Latin America, inclusion of uh, blind people through training and employment, and then moving on to other projects in Europe, Middle East, US. And then uh, someone uh, called me and said, hey, do, why don't you come over to Atlanta, Georgia, work at uh, Georgia Tech? And I said, what? So it's actually that person over there, that gentleman there, the far side of the table, that actually the culprit for me moving to Atlanta. I moved back to Madrid, that's where I'm from, uh, just October. And I joined uh, Accessibility Oz, with whom uh, I've been working for some time already. And I'm really excited about uh, all that's uh, ahead of us. So um, I'm going to talk to you about um, what we do at Accessibility Oz, and I'm going to focus on video. So it's great that Christian talked about video, some video stats uh, earlier today in the session. So um, I'm showing on the screen a picture of a lady, Jeanne Wild. She's the founder. She founded Accessibility Oz in 2011. Uh, she's a serial entrepreneur. Um, <clears throat> she's been uh, involved in the W3C uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines work uh, t task forces for many, many years. So she's uh, been one of the people in charge of actually creating the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is the, let's say, uh, one of the main foundations of, of what we do, which is uh, basically helping organizations uh, make sure that their websites, their digital content is fully accessible or as accessible as possible. It's not always possible to make everything fully accessible, as we know, everything digital. But we strive to help organizations uh, reach that goal. And uh, we do it uh, by helping them with, with audits, doing audits. Uh, we test on mobile. We develop websites using Drupal as well, um, WordPress. Uh, we test content management systems as well, uh, learning management systems. We do design for them. And uh, we develop a set of tools, Oz, um, OzArt, which is an automated reporting tool, which actually scans a whole website or a whole portal and gives you a whole report, detailed report of all the errors that you have, all the uh, violations of the uh, accessibility guidelines, and tells you how to resolve them and why are they are they're wrong and how to resolve them. Uh, we have a whole wiki, we've built a whole wiki on errors, why errors happen and how can you resolve them. That's, that's the Oz wiki and we populate it every, every week with, with new possibilities, new solutions, information. It's, it's a repository of, of knowledge and accessibility. And uh, we also developed something called the Oz player, right? So we found that, um, you know, that many players out there, many video players out there are not accessible. And I'm going to go through some stats that Christian has already introduced here as well. So online, like for example, 33% of all online activity, maybe a bit more, a bit less, but more or less on average, is uh, watching video, right? And 66% of all internet traffic, which so that's something, you know, in, and in increasing. And 50% uh, at least of all video content is accessible uh, via mobile device, which is interesting because we all have at least one mobile device in our pockets. Maybe two, three, <laughs> it depends. Uh, crazy stats about uh, video, video watched on Facebook, for example, you know, 500 million people watching every day, 100 million hours, so that's ridiculous. One, video, one billion hours of, of video watched on YouTube every day and increasing. And then some additional interesting things, like for example, that 85% um, of Facebook videos are watched without sound. Okay, that starts giving you some hints of uh, where I'm headed. And uh, also that uh, we've observed that captions uh, increase uh, the completion of you viewing a video, right? You view a whole video if you have captions in more than 40%, with a 40% difference, right? Also, corporations, businesses that have videos, see that uh, when they provide transcripts, 
you know, uh, the revenue is impacted in 16%, which is much, even more interesting. And then, uh, last but not least, 80% uh, of all the people that use captions, uh, they use them not because they are deaf or hard of hearing, but maybe because it makes it easier for them to get the information from that video, right? So we think of a noisy environment, you know, let's say a conference out there, you know, and uh, we're all talking, whatever, and there's someone speaking on screen on one of the rooms, you know, and we want to know what he's or she's saying, but we can't hear anything. So we would like to have captions. Same thing if we are in a quiet environment, like this one, for example, and we want to watch some, you know, some video while I'm talking to you and boring you or something, you know, but you can turn on the volume or maybe you don't have headphones, right? So you want to know what's happening, right? So there's a few things that uh, we think are important when creating a, an accessible uh, video experience. Not the video, not the video player, we're going to talk about that but actually the whole experience, right? So for example, we think it's important that there's no flashing content. You know, you've probably uh, heard about that uh, episode, Pokemon episode 1997, you know, where there was some battle between some characters that there was some flashing content. Result of that, uh, several hundred uh, kids in Japan were taken to hospital because of, uh, because of seizures. So that's a, f a photosensitive uh, epilepsy, so that's important. Another really annoying thing is when, it, when the video auto plays, when you open a video, you open a website and it starts playing automatically, right? So that's something to avoid completely, right? The whole video needs to be, the content needs to be accessible. You're gonna need uh, captions, of course, you're gonna need, if needed, audio descriptions, and you're gonna provide a transcript, okay, of whatever is being captioned, right? But then, the video player, okay? Is a video player always accessible? No. What do you mean by a video player being accessible, right? Well, you need to be able to access it through the keyboard only. Maybe you're not using a mouse. There's many people that don't use a mouse for different reasons that we know, right? Uh, you must be able to turn the captions on and off. Uh, you must be able to support audio description. If the video has audio description, you must be able to turn it on and off, right? You must be able to detect it. And also, uh, how you use color to convey information, you know, the volume is high or low and so forth. Access to the transcript and must not crash when you use like different, uh, you know, browsers and operating systems, which is a <laughs> typical thing that happens, right? So we said, okay, let's go ahead and let's uh, build our own video player. So I'm gonna show you real quick. Thank you. Um, okay. It's here, I'm using a mouse in my case, right? So this is our player, this is in our website, and this is the player, it's basically a skin, right? You give me the link to your player, maybe it's stored in YouTube, whatever. I give you, I, I put it into a code generator, I give you back the code, you embed it in your website, so you get a skin, and you get the player, right? So what I mean by accessible video player is that I can easily navigate, can you, uh, what I'm doing is tabbing, I'm tabbing here, I'm, I'm going through, I'm putting the focus on different buttons here, and the focus gives you like a blue color on top of the uh, control, whatever it is, and I can go back, right, uh, back and forth. So you see that I'm placing the focus here on, on the button that is closed caption, audio description as well, right? So I can turn on and off when I have one of those. So the, obviously the player needs to detect that, right? Okay, whenever this starts, okay, but the, the whole point is, the bottom line here is that I need to have full control, right, of my player, okay, from the keyboard, right? This is Jian, she's the founder, uh, right? I have activated the, you know, the captions, I can turn them on and off, whatever, I'm not sure if there's audio description here, probably not, because it's not needed, but there's settings where you're gonna need audio description, right? Um, when we talk about video accessibility, you know, things that, that your player must support. Quickly, I'm navigating to a, another page here in the website where I'm showing a matrix of all the features, accessibility features that are supported by our player, right? So we thought, okay, let's, let's see how accessible our player is as compared to other players out there in the marketplace. So I'm moving back to the podium here. Oh, can we just shift to the... 
presentation. Cheers. <coughs> okay. Right. So we. So there's some really uh, nice features about that I've already shown you. Um, one of them is that it's free for nonprofits. Okay. Uh, with revenue under one million dollars. So so uh, if you're for nonprofit, uh, is I guess revenue under one million dollars a year. You're good to go. You can get it for free. Right, there's a pricing model here, 500 for enterprises, 500 a year. So we thought, okay, let's see how it works. Let's see how accessible it is as compared to many other players out there in the marketplace. Many of them we know. So I've listed here some 26, but I, we actually tested 36. Okay, many really well-known ones like YouTube. You know, YouTube embedded. Uh, PayPal has its own player, Amazon. But then Kaltura is a typical one, like in higher education settings, Vimeo, uh, JW, many, right? And we looked for uh, what we call showstoppers, things that mess up the whole uh, uh, video experience, right? So the audio plays automatically, or there's keyboard traps. Keyboard traps means that if I'm trying to navigate through the keyboard controls, you know, on my player, I can go back and forth and not uh, that, that I find myself in one control, one of the buttons, and I can go back. I can get out of that one, right? It, 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 uh, let's say it, it crashes or it, it just uh, stalls there, right? And also when I go into full screen, I can go back into normal screen. <laughs> that not always happens. Or maybe that the player cannot be played, you know, controlled through the keyboard, or I can pause it, or, or the video player uh, crashes when I'm using certain um, uh, browsers or operating systems. We reviewed all those. We went through very, very thorough testing in different settings using different uh, operating systems on a laptop, um, on, op on um, <clears throat> mobile devices, uh, different phones, different smartphones, tablets. So the results were that uh, there's only two players, and we congratulate ourselves that ours is one of the <laughs> really good ones. We didn't cheat, I can guarantee. The results of the, of the testing are available on our website. I can share them with you. So ours is close to 100%, 97%. There is small glitches here and there we try to resolve. That's because new versions of operating systems and so forth and browsers are released all the time. So we just try to keep up with that. And then Able Player, another really, really accessible one. Okay? So those are the two ones, the two video players that I would recommend. Right, using if you've got uh, a lot of videos or, or not that many videos in your website, but you want everybody to be able to use them, right? So um, <clears throat> we are going to be starting it in, in other settings. For example, um, Mac. We tested on laptop, but but uh, Windows. We're going to be start uh, testing it on on Mac environment. And uh, the bottom line here and the takeaway is that uh, for every uh, every of the everyone uh, every, uh, sorry every showstopper what we call showstopper what messes up the whole video experience, there's going to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of people that just simply can't see what you're offering through your video, you know? So uh, you may want to look into that. You want to resolve that, see how that can be improved. And uh, there's one of my colleagues that says, uh, video, he's blind, right? He's in, in, in Poland. He's one of our ex experts in accessibility. So he says, video is a very important source of information. It's a remarkable aspect in a culture today. We know that. Blind individuals must not be excluded from access to data provided in video content. We cannot see, but, you can, but we can understand. Okay? So um, with that, um, I'm done with the brief presentation. Christian, I need to talk with you, <laughs> for sure. And uh, I'll open to questions. Please, not very difficult one. Thank you very much, Ricardo. <laughs> I would just like to start with the business model. Can you explain a little bit how you, how, I mean, you obviously did a lot of work already and how is the business part of it set? Right, so, so this, is, this is part of the whole uh, uh, revenue model. Uh, uh, Ausplayer would be part of the revenue model. Um, <clears throat> for example, the, uh, the uh, reporting, the testing and reporting tool, Ozart, you know, is a fee-based uh, software as a service that we are offering. Uh, also, the other services support, you know, the whole structure. So, Ausplayer would not be the uh, only single source of revenue. Now, we thought that you know, it was important to disseminate this, 
this knowledge and uh, you know the importance of, of video accessibility. That's why we are offering uh, it for free to nonprofits that are under one million dollars of revenue annually, of course. So basically, it's supported uh, by the other uh, uh, revenue sources of the of the company, right? So we are expecting to see an increase in you know an uptake in people adopting and actually paying for it, especially in the enterprise and uh, higher ed uh, sphere, which is our, one of our main targets. Because from what we know and from what I've seen at uh, Georgia Tech for several years, um, of course, um, uh, instructional, material, instructional content at university and educational settings is uh, relying more and more on video, right? And we've seen for many years, of course, that uh, it's not always uh, this video, this media, that is being used as instructional materials is not always accessible. I mean, actually, it's pretty inaccessible, you know, to a large extent, right? So we're looking at, at that. We are expecting an increase in, in revenue from from us uh, from us player. So technology is not the root cause of change. We know that, right? Okay, you're trying to change the way people access videos. You're trying to change the way instructions that are given in different things. And then, you know, goes back to her question, which is the business model, right? It's just another technology. And you said you tested 32 players. So does the world need another player? And how can you work with those other players? And those other players are bigger than you in that sense, right? Yes. So. My point is, it's a bit unclear to me where you want to take it. I see the potential of the technology. I see the need of the technology. I do not understand a clearly defined business model or what you're trying to do, right? I mean, it's nice we, if we watch videos that you can do auto captioning, you can do different things. But now we know, for example, PowerPoint now will have this feature where you will do auto captioning, auto translations. So there's a lot of things coming out there. How will you differentiate yourself? Well, uh, we're trying to differentiate ourselves through, through these features and the impact they have in uh, large communities, people that, that use uh, assistive technologies, right? The people that we are serving, you know, many of us here in this, in this conference, and um, showing organizations that, uh, you know, that provide a lot of video content, how important it is to cater to all those underserved populations. And this is a typical word, you know, we use all the time, but it's true. I mean, what impact does it have on them not being able to access that, you know, customer base that is being left out, you know? In terms of, for example, higher education, how many students are dropping out because they cannot access the content, right? Okay. So, so your customer, let's say the ITU, I work for the ITU, right? We push a lot of accessibility, as uh, some of you know. So if we use a lot of videos from mm -hmm. YouTube, or we put a yes. lot of videos in YouTube, mm -hmm. instead we could make a, your player available to watch yep. all these things, then yep. it will auto-define the accessibility part. That's, that's one of the mm -hmm. models. Right, and many and more for example, if you're in a higher education setting or post-secondary setting, that would mean that more students would eventually either uh, complete their, you know, get their degree successfully, finish their degree, or maybe even, uh, you know, um, sign up in your university as well, you know, or your university setting, right? So there's definitely, a, you know, a, 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 there's definitely a revenue increase goal for organizations that can see that, you know, more people can actually benefit and can access, I can see their products, I can receive their services. In this case, education, for example, if, we, if we're thinking of uh, corporations that are trying to convey what they do through videos, all do, right? Are they really conveying this kind of information to everybody? Or, or are they leaving out a large percentage of, you know, of their customer potential, customer base. So that's the kind of business case we're trying to bring to the table and to prove to them, right? So this is all like a sequence. It's, hey, this is very, very accessible. Yeah, but I mean, why, what, I, what are you telling me? Why is it of interest to me, right? Well, because of this other reason, as we know, okay? One last question, please. Anybody? Yeah, Ricardo, um, I'm familiar with the product and, and I really commend Accessibility Oz for putting up front that it's accessible. There are so many organizations out there that are tied to disabilities yep. that a lot of the websites aren't accessible, a lot of the products aren't accessible. So I do commend um, 
to somebody else for doing that. I think the one feature that I see within um, this product that seems to stand out is the audio description piece. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right, so, so um, audio, is everybody familiar with audio description is here? Or anyone no. is well, not no. familiar with it? Right, so, so audio description is basically a feature that you can add to your videos when there is some, when there is a content going on on your video and no one is, I mean, there's no voice over describing it, okay? But still, I mean, blind people, visually impaired people don't know what's going on, right? So we need to describe what's going on, on you know, on the on screen, on the video, right? For certain settings, I mean, for, for example, for movies, that's very important in documentaries because you're conveying some really significant content. For, for example, for a, a instructional content, it's critical. It's absolutely critical because otherwise, I mean, the professor, the teacher is going to ask, you know, in the exam, for example, he's going to be asking content from the video that maybe is not being described by a voiceover, right? You're going to need that additional um, audio description because the teacher is going to ask about that later on on, this, on the exam, right? So that's a feature that you add. It's, an, it's like another track that you add to the, to the, it can be done in different ways. But the video player we've seen, it's got to support it. You've got to need a way to turn it on and off depending on whether you need it. It's got to be on the video anyway, but you've got to be able to activate it on and off, right? And the video player needs to detect it, okay? It needs to support it. So that's why it's so important, especially, as I said, in, a, in an uh, educational setting. Okay. Ricardo, thank you very much. Thank you. I will ask the panelists for a final statement when we now come to the end of our uh, Zero Project version of Shark Tanks. However, uh, before that, I would like to make one statement myself. Um, I really enjoyed this discussion here, and I enjoyed very much more using the experts and giving advice and asking about business model rather than haggling about percentages for one million which you can get. So thank you very much to the panelists. Please. Uh, <laughs> Please, probably we start on your side, Lee. I mean, I enjoyed all the, all the presentations, thank you. Um, being from the academic setting um, for, for many years, I think the, the chances of, of really linking to incubation programs, as I mentioned earlier on, would be something that I would recommend for all the panelists to look at. Um, the expertise that comes from these incubation programs are pretty impressive. Um, linking to angel funders, um, tying you to other products that are similar or not similar. So I would just recommend um, doing that. But thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I've also thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it was a wide variety of things. One thing which um, uh, struck me and what I always sort of pay attention to as a funder is that there seems to be very male-dominated uh, pitches. That could be a coincidence, um, uh, but that's also something, if we talk about diversity and inclusion, which I think is very important, which I'm sure you do in your organizations, but it's also good maybe to show it, uh, I think. But that's my personal note. And thank you so much for everything. Thank you. But at least our panel was equal. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have come. <laughs> well, I enjoyed all the presentations. I think they all have potentials, um, but you, some of them have to look at the business model a bit more and try to really access resources in terms of, you know, what our previous uh, colleagues said, which is incubation program, angels, you know, because we've added, you, you, you know, it's great, you know, how many billion people are we? Seven billion people? Everybody wakes up with a great idea every day. What makes the difference? The passion that each of you have to solve this problem. And I've seen this passion come from every one of you. So, and um, I really wish a lot of you, all of you actually luck. And some of you, I think, are more personally touched by than others, but that's every investor's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I also have to say that all the presentations are really good ideas that actually solve problems, and that's very important. So you actually address a problem that, that, that is there and that, that needs a solution. So, I mean, that's, that's a very big step, step, step that needs to be uh, made. Uh, again, a little bit on a business, uh, business side. Um, the, the presentations have been, the projects are in different levels of, uh, of development, so of course each one of you has totally different 
next step in terms of uh, uh, business development. Um, the ones that are at the very beginning, yes, please do take a closer look into how, how could you improve the business, um, um, talk to people, uh, get into programs, that, as Guy said already. Um, take a little bit more time to, to put that part in place as well. And I wish you all a lot of luck. Thank you. Well, with this, we're coming to an end with a very special session here of the Zero Conference, which I think is at the heart of the Zero Conference. It's about innovation. It's about innovation for a world without barriers. And this is now up to us to support what we have seen, to use our network to support these four great projects which have presented and push them the next step further. Thank you very much for the presenters. Applause, please. Thank you much, very much for the panelists here for your great expertise. I think pushing this further, asking what is exactly the business model, what is exactly the market you want to address, and also where can you find the help? The, the ones at the beginning, at the incubators, and the other probably at the funders end, and, at, and finding other partnerships to, to around the world. I think this was really great input from your side. Thank you very much for coming. Well, and thanks everybody for participating. It was a great pleasure for me to host this session, and I hope you take away what your task is to make this innovation successful. Thank you very much.